Hello, Facebook. Good to see you out there. This is Pastor Chad coming to you with Truth Alive this evening. I want to welcome you. As you'll notice tonight, I am uh, here by myself. Uh, Pastor Thad, unfortunately, tonight is under the weather. He is unable to, to make it tonight, but uh, I'm going to be logging in and trying to track and work with you on the events that uh, that we are uh, doing here with Truth Alive. So welcome. If you're here, give me a shout out. Let me know that you've made it. Um, I want to tell you hi and uh, make sure that you know that uh, we can see you. I'm going to be adjusting a little bit here because we're rolling solo tonight. Uh, if you have a few moments and you can say a prayer for Pastor Thad, please do. He is uh, just feeling a little under the weather tonight and his... Um, his health would be greatly ameliorated, I believe, with prayers to the Lord uh, for him. David Braylon, God bless you. Welcome. It's great to have you. I'm glad you're with us tonight. Um, we are uh, here at Truth Alive. We come to you on Thursday evenings, and we answer your biblical questions. Pastor Trey, welcome. Thank you for coming on uh, with us tonight. Um, Pastor Thad, again, my uh, my companion in this work, uh, he's under the weather today, so uh, I'm just encouraging you, please, to, to say prayers for him. Brother Aaron, uh, God bless you. Welcome. Uh, Debbie, my mother, good <laughs> good to see you. I love you. Welcome. Um, I'm Pastor Chad from Church Alive, uh, and we'll be sharing with you uh, information tonight and answering your biblical questions. Pastor Colleen, God bless you. Welcome. Uh, are you able to hear me out there? I want to make sure technically you're able to uh, hear me coming through. Pastor Thad, who is out sick, is actually even joining us. God bless you. I love you too. Pastor Thad, welcome. Uh, we love you. We're praying for you. Uh, as we take a few moments here before we get started, I want to give you a few moments to go ahead and log in. Uh, this ministry is specifically uh, endeavoring to answer your Bible-based questions. So we want to encourage you to send questions in and to uh, receive biblical-based answers. So tonight, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I am going uh, at this mono tonight by myself, uh, but Pastor Thad is uh, really here with us. I guess he's online. He just doesn't have any voice, um, but we are praying that he'll be back with us next week uh, on the next installment of Truth Alive. So uh, Pastor Thad and I, Pastor Chad, we are the Truth Alive guys. And we will be accepting your questions and providing answers to those. We have a few questions that came in from last week that I want to be able to address with you. Uh, if you're just joining, please give us a, a hello and a shout and a wave. I want to know that you're here. Um, I see the folks that have come in so far, and God bless you. Welcome. We're just going to take a few moments before we get started uh, with this particular episode. So give us a wave. Let us know that you're there. Or tell us hi. You can also begin to send in your questions. John Andy, it's great to see you. God bless you, brother. I'm glad that you're here tonight. Welcome. Uh, we will be uh, going through and talking about some answers to some questions we had from previous weeks and seeking to uh, provide some biblical illumination. Carol, God bless you. Welcome. It's wonderful to have you tonight. I'm glad that you're with us. Um, you are welcome to send in questions. I will do my best. Um, uh, Pastor Thad and I moderate back and forth and capture uh, information. Tonight, that's going to be a bit more of a challenge, uh, but we are going to go ahead and I'm going to be answering the biblical-based questions, starting with what you had from last week and moving forward. We have some tremendous questions that came in. Uh, Diana, welcome. God bless you. It's, I'm glad you were able to log in tonight. It's good to see you. Um, uh, for those of you that are just coming in, um, I'm Pastor Chad. Uh, this is Truth Alive. We come to you on Thursday evenings. Uh, we're taking a few minutes. Elizabeth, welcome. We're glad to have you tonight. Uh, we're letting you log in, just taking a few moments before we start. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, you are getting your biblical-based questions answered. Uh, you know, the Bible is relevant to every uh, issue in life, uh, whether it be uh, how you address relationships uh, your preparations and, and salvation for eternity. Uh, it is uh, the living word of God. And this scripture can literally lead you into the very mind of the Lord God who created everything. And I want to encourage you to know this word, to apply this word to your life, uh, to make it a part of who you are. Um, I believe that moreover, by these commandments, thy servant is warned, and in the keeping of them is great reward. Uh, Sister Lindsay, welcome. So glad to have you. I see that the entire youth house, uh, did you know that they are gathering now on Thursday nights? Shout out to the youth house. 
and they watch these videos. Sister Tasha, welcome. Glad to have you. Ann Kelly, welcome. God bless you. Uh, we love you. I'm praying that you're also in quick recovery. Uh, Leanne, welcome. God bless you. Welcome. We're glad to have you tonight. Uh, just taking a few seconds as we're warming up here and getting started with Truth Alive. Uh, for those of you that are wondering why it's just me, Pastor Thad is down. He's under the weather tonight. So uh, in a few seconds, I'm going to ask you to join with me. We're going to say a, a prayer for him, and then we're going to jump into the Word. I'm adjusting this camera on the fly. Uh, I hope you don't mind. Um, but welcome. For those of you that are coming in, uh, we're going to be answering your biblical-based questions, starting with some questions from last time and then moving forward and beginning to uh, really share um, about really uh, some things that are going to talk about eternity and talk about heaven. We're going to talk about what happens tonight a little bit after you pass from this earth into the next. So we had a really great question, a, a series of great questions, but we want to jump in and tackle some of those uh, here today. So for if you're just joining us, welcome. Christine, welcome. God bless you. It's wonderful to have you uh, being uh, with us tonight. God bless you. Um, so let's just take a few seconds. I do want to bless this time when we're together. I also want to say a prayer of recovery for Pastor Thad. I know, I believe that Pastor or Sister Ann, you were also under the weather today. So I do want to mention you in prayer too. So uh, Facebook family, if you would for a second, let's just take a moment and, and, and ask the Lord for his blessing. So Heavenly Father, I just honor you and, and give you glory. I thank you for Jesus Christ, your son. I just ask you to fill this place, uh, fill every home that's watching with us, Lord. And I ask you tonight to please send healing to Pastor Thad. Lord, bless his home. I ask you uh, to completely raise him up. I pray against all illness and pray for quick recovery in Jesus' name. Lord, I ask you also for Ann Kelly. Lord, raise her up, healing in her body. Touch her, Lord, and give her strength. Lord, everyone else that's tonight at home, they've got a sick one or a loved one in the house, please send your blessing and your healing to their lives in Jesus' name. Uh, Catherine Hendricks, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're so glad to have you with us again, Pastor Thad, out tonight. So the Truth Alive Guys is just Truth Alive Guy tonight. But uh, we will be doing the best to answer questions. Pastor Thad and I did have an opportunity to discuss some of your questions before we came online tonight, I want to answer those. So welcome. If you do have a biblical-based question, please post it. I'll do my best tonight. We're kind of without that extra moderator. Uh, I'll try to get to your, to your questions. One thing I do want to let you know, family, is for those of you that are uh, putting in questions, if you go back and watch former videos... Pastor Thad and I have tried to go back and look at those, but as our volume of Church Alive episodes grows, it becomes more and more difficult to be able to answer those questions. So if we don't get the question within about a week's time, come back on. You can repost your question, and we'll try to get back to you the best that we can. Um, it is just a challenge for us, especially as we, if we start to get, you know, 20, 40 videos on there uh, to go back and find it from episode three, uh, hour two, what did somebody say, or I'm sorry, uh, minute two. So hopefully you're able to do that. Uh, Kathy, welcome. We're glad to have you with us tonight. Uh, Janine, hi, Janine, welcome. Glad to have you with us tonight. So we're going to be talking about uh, some of your biblical-based questions. One of the first questions that we had posted last night, I'm sorry, last time was a very good one. And the question was this, can I still go to heaven if I'm harboring even the slightest amount of resentment and unforgiveness in my heart? And uh, will I end up in a situation where I'm not uh, able to go to heaven? Um, and what I want to let you know is, is that in a place where if a person's harboring any resentment in their heart whatsoever, uh, does that automatically disqualify you from heaven? I want to talk about really what the Bible talks about first about forgiveness. Jesus says, if you don't forgive others, you cannot be forgiven. So if you insist upon holding a grudge against someone else's life, then you cannot be forgiven. But I do want to talk to you about feelings versus action. I believe that often what happens in many of our situations, Vinny Montano, welcome. Uh, I believe in many of, of our situations, what happens is, is that sometimes we have to begin to confess and, and work in the actions of forgiveness and sometimes give our emotions time to catch up. Um, I believe in many cases 
Uh, it is very important, and I do believe in the power of confession. And Jesus talked about praying for those that have hurt you or despitefully used you, uh, that you would actually pray blessings on them and not curses. So with that question, one of the very important pieces of being able to uh, go to heaven is not just about do I get to go to heaven or not, but the idea is, is if I'm in a situation where I'm keeping unforgiveness, that is I refuse to let go of someone's hurt or offense against me, and I continue to hold that against that individual, and I, begin, I continue to act out of that functioning, Will I inherit heaven? And the answer is no. If you continue to harbor that and hold it, you will not be forgiven. That's what Jesus told us. It is a, a, a requirement. In fact, Jesus gave a parable and he said that there was a man uh, that owed a great king a vast amount of money. Let's say in modern terms, a million dollars. And the man was a commoner. He didn't have a million dollars. And the, the master heard his plea and he said, oh, I understand. Real quick, Cheyenne, welcome. Jen Lamson, welcome. Glad to have you tonight. And he said, I can't repay. And it says that this king of this land was very moved with compassion for him. And so he went out and said, I, uh, I'm going to step forward and say, I'm going to forgive that debt to you. You are fine to go ahead. Uh, go on with your life. Well, when he was released, he went back out and he found a man that owed him $20. And in owing him $20, he ran to this man. And the scripture says, basically he says, pay me the $20 that you owe me. And the man says, I don't have it right now, but I will repay all. And he says, how dare you? And he takes him by the neck, the scripture says, and he hauls him off to debtor's prison and has him thrown into prison. Well, word gets back to this rich ruler and he says, what is this I've heard you've done? I forgave you this immense amount of, of grievance and an oh against me. And yet you have gone and thrown another man into debtor's prison. This is not right. You have not functioned in accordance with the mercy that I showed. And as a result, he was then thrown into prison for his debts. But please understand when you've been deeply hurt by someone, understand that it can be a process. I'm going to give some practical tools. Samantha Campos, thanks for logging in. God bless you. Welcome. In that process, number one, I believe there's a key that Jesus provided when he said, pray for those. Jen Lamson, how are you? God bless you. Welcome. Pray for those who despitefully use you and those that do all matter of offense against you. And if you will do that and pray for them, I believe what happens is this. This is an awesome spiritual principle. Don Kelly, welcome. God bless you. Great to have you tonight. If you are in that situation, I believe... This is a belief, and I think this will be something to build your faith, that if you begin to pray blessings on someone to hurt you, I know, and it'll feel like gravel in your mouth when you first do it, but if you begin to do that, you will begin to command over your spirit. Christy Dewey, hi, welcome, God bless you. It will begin to be something that you begin to pray blessings, and it will not be easy. It is going to sacrifice and crucify your flesh to do this, but you begin to pray, Father, <laughs> bless them, and bless them with good. What I believe happens, now this is a belief, please, when I talk about the difference between theology and my ideology, I'm offering you an ideological principle I believe is true, but it's not necessarily theology, okay? So guard it. But I believe when you begin to pray blessings and your obedience to Christ, Trey Schrader, welcome, God bless you, Uncle Trey, we love you. When you begin to pray those blessings up, that person I believe needs to be in position to receive those blessings. Now, the Bible says that my word will not return to me void. If you go back and then pray over that person, they're not in position, that blessing has to go somewhere. I believe because of your obedience and alignment, God will begin to produce for you the blessing in your life of healing that they're unable to receive. That's my belief. I believe that has happened in my own life. That, and when I took to myself, and it took me time, but to get to a place, especially when you've been very injured in your spirit, you go to someone and you begin to pray blessings, even over those that persecute you, speak all matter of evil against you. I believe those blessings from the Father will come. But most importantly, what forgiveness means, it means letting the other person go free. It does not justify what the person did to you. You are not consenting to or acquiescing to be treated in that manner. But what it says is, is I'm going to remove my my own forces to try to draw punishment for that person. And instead, I'm going to release over them 
blessing. So I hope that helps. Um, <laughs> I see a post that says, uh, lol, my mom always says, bless them, Lord, and bless them real hard. Uh, that's a great quote. I like that. That's funny. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Remember, your emotions do not define your position. What defines your position is what you do. And so I encourage you strongly to begin to pray for people that hurt you. Pray, number one, that God would forgive them. Pray, number two, that they would come to wisdom for what they did. And number three, pray that you are in a circumstance to where they can go forward. Um, I, one of the questions came forward real quick. I'm going to answer this. It says, uh, what if the person doesn't remember doing the harm? I think that that is uh, not a, a, a necessary condition. Uh, what I would say is instead of saying that they have to have uh, known what they did, often I don't think you necessarily, uh, the Bible does say if someone offends you, go to them. That is a biblical principle. If they're like, I don't have any recollection, I don't remember doing that, that's not what I meant. Sometimes that can even bring clarification to the circumstance. But your emotions, even if the person's like, nah, I don't receive that, does not define it. We're talking about a cathartic effort in the heart to clean out your heart, right, to God. He is the one that can wash your heart. Eventually, your emotions will follow. That is the important thing. Never let your emotions dictate where you stand. It's got to be based upon the word. And this is a very important piece. I see somebody posting up there. I need to write this down. Let me just encourage you. Uh, you also can go back and read, uh, get the historical archives of this. This is my first night flying solo. Pastor Thad, he is out tonight. So uh, say prayers for him. If you're joining us late, you are on Truth Alive. Welcome. God bless you. I'm so thankful that you are with us. Um, I have a question here that came through. What if you don't know you're harboring unforgiveness? Well, one of the things, I think it's a great question, Tasha, thank you for reposting. One of the things that happens, I think, is that uh, in many cases, when, when something is unsettled in your spirit, um, I believe in taking that before the Lord, and often God will start to shine this little pin light into your heart. Uh, things will begin to come out. Now, I believe, remember, to harbor unforgiveness, I believe, is to hold someone to your own standard of accountability for their judgment. The problem is, is that when Jesus, I mean, if you think about Jesus at the cross, when Jesus went to the cross for my sins, he literally took into his perfect pure body a beating, a crucifixion, a, an embarrassment, a shame to be crucified naked in front of people, to be paraded through the streets. And we're talking about the one who created the streets, <laughs> right? To be paraded in front of because of what I did. That was my action. For me to hold harbor resentment against someone else, well, that just says that they were in the same condition that I was at the time that I committed the sin. Actually, what I'm praying is, is Lord, let them come to the realization and to give their heart over to uh, the ways of God and praying blessings, spiritual blessings upon them. And yes, even protective blessings. You don't want someone going about hurting someone. But when you take on the role of being the judge, that is very problematic. Now, also remember this. Remember that scripture in the Bible that says, judge not and you'll be not judged. Mm. Here's one of the things I really think it's important that you pay attention to as a Christian. And that is that if you um, go through a process where you are judging, what that really means is, is that you are carrying out the execution of that judgment. It's saying, judge not that you be not judged. That, and then another place of scripture, it says, judge righteously. It's not telling you that you can't ever look at issues and not spiritually discern if something is right or wrong. What it's actually saying is, is you are not the one to carry out that judgment, right? It's not to say that you can't look at something and say, that was incorrect. When something's been done and an offense is done to you, you have the ability to step back and say, that was incorrect. But Lord, I'm bringing this to you for justice and for mercy. And I believe that's how you need to pray. Uh, welcome, Tammy. Glad to have you. God bless you. Uh, Pastor Thad is out tonight. Uh, I am flying solo. He could use your prayers for a quick recovery. Uh, after tonight, my voice will probably also need uh, an ability to recover quickly. Um, but for those of you that are joining us, God bless you. Welcome. Thank you for taking time out of your night. I do want to give a couple of announcements real quick. Um, we are not going to be coming on Truth Alive on February the 14th. 
That is uh, Valentine's Day. Many of you are going to be having other plans. I know my, uh, my cohort and myself, uh, we're going to be in different places. We want you to have that night off, spend it with your loved ones, with your family, uh, and then come back and join us. So again, no on, uh, on the, the Thursday after next. That'll be uh, Thursday, February 21st. We will not be having <clears throat> this episode of Truth Alive, but we will be back the following week. <clears throat> Gloria, welcome. God bless you. Thanks for joining us. Debbie, welcome. Debbie Tipton, great to see you. Thank you for taking time out to join us tonight. Um, we've been talking so far on Truth Alive about forgiveness. Uh, a question came up, says, if I harbor even the least amount of, of animosity in my heart towards someone, will God still forgive me? And the question is, as long as you are holding on to the right to say, I have the right to carry out judgment, even if that's verbal, trying to turn other people against that person, whatever, that is not a correct heart posture. But if you are in a situation where you are saying, God, I'm giving it to you, prayer believes becomes very important to the washing of your own heart. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ forgives us of all sins. We have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ forgives us of all sins. James even says, how can blessing and cursing come out of the same spring? This things ought not be so. We need to have clean water coming out of the same of the same well of our heart out of his belly will flow rivers of living water not bitter water think about it Josh Suter welcome glad to have you tonight so if you have a biblical based question i want to encourage you to go ahead and post that i'm answering some questions first from last week if you've already posted a question i literally have to come up on the screen to, to scroll it so go ahead and post it or repost it for uh, one of our folks cuz i don't have another phone down here to be able to answer um uh, we have some people, Pastor Thad, that are even posting up uh, some recipes that could help your voice. Um, I might take some of those myself right after this. So thank you so much. Uh, God bless you guys. I appreciate your love and your care. Harriet Louise, God bless you. There's family. I love you. Welcome. Thanks for coming on Truth Alive tonight. I'm Pastor Chad. Pastor Thad is out tonight, but he will be back with us soon. Uh, Dina Mays, welcome. God bless you. Um, let me read the, the what is posted. It says, uh, only people um, that I've been hurt. Uh, it'll take just a second. It's loading. I'll get to it. Michelle Suter, God bless you. Welcome for coming on Truth Alive tonight. I'm Pastor Chad. I'm answering your biblical questions, responding to some questions first from last week. If you have a question, you're welcome to post it. If I miss it because I'm flying solo or kind of without the moderating piece tonight, please repost it and I will try to come back to answer that question. Another question that came to us was basically, if you're absent from the body, are you present with the Lord? And so what I want to share is, is if you are absent from the body, the Bible teaches us that as Christians, being absent from the body, we are instantly present with the Lord. So let me give a little bit of explanation in the past um, about what went on. Cheyenne, I see your question, um, and I will go back and take a look and answer that in just a moment. So I'll hang tight with that question, and I will come back. So what, is, what happens is this. In the Old Testament, when people would pass away, they did not enter into heaven. If you will remember in the book of Hebrews, in the Hall of Faith chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, it tells us that many people by faith did all these wonderful works. They had their children raised from the dead. They escaped the mouths of the lion. They went through a process by which they over, went through, walked through Red Seas. They had these tremendous experiences. But they died not having received the promise. The promise of what? They weren't able to, in their life, lay hold on eternity in heaven with God. Brendan Meyer, thank you for joining. Welcome. So let me explain this. Jesus gives us, a, he, not a parable, but a story of Lazarus and the rich man. In the Old Testament, before Jesus Christ went to the cross, when individuals die, you can find this in the parable of Lazarus and the rich man in the Gospels. What happened was, is that the people were carried down to a place called Abraham's bosom. That place of Abraham's bosom was a holding place, a restful place, where people awaited deliverance to be taken up to heaven. How do we know that? Well, it's inferred, but from a couple different scriptures. Number one, there's a very interesting passage of scripture. When Saul was been cut off from the presence of God. He went to a, a medium, a woman called the Witch of Endor, and he asked to conjure up 
the spirit of Samuel the prophet who had passed on. She did this work, conjured up Samuel out of the earth. And she says, I see him coming. He's wrapped in a mantle. He's coming up and Samuel has a conversation. Now there's arguments. Is this a demonic spirit? Was this actually Samuel? I fully believe this was actually Samuel. The individual recognizes Saul, prophesies correctly what's going to happen, and also gives this interesting statement. He says, why have you brought me up from my rest? The Bible tells us in the back in the Gospels with Lazarus and the rich man that when Samuel was, I'm sorry, when the rich man and Lazarus died, they were separated inside the earth. There was a gulf set before them and there was no way to cross over between the two. Stacy, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Crystal Varner, welcome. Glad to have you. So what happened was, is that they were standing across from one another and the rich man cries out to Abraham and says, I'm in torment. Will you send Lazarus to come dip the, t his t finger in water and cool the tip of my tongue? He says, he can't pass over to you. You spent your life in tremendous blessings, but now you're in torments. He has spent his life in torments, but now he has entered into rest. So this poor man that was, was laying at the gate of the rich man's home, this Lazarus character, he must have been a righteous man, but no one showed compassion and mercy on him. Well, in, in the Abraham's bosom, he was in a place of rest. And that is the same thing that is said of Samuel when he came up. He says, why did you interrupt my rest? Now, here's an amazing part. So all the Old Testament saints, we believe, who died in faith, Abraham, the father of faith, it would make sense that this is a place called Abraham's bosom. When they were in faith, they were not yet still able to go to heaven. Why? Because Jesus had not yet ascended to the Father and sprinkled his own blood upon the mercy seat of the Ark of a Covenant that exists in heaven. Yes, believe it or not, when Moses developed the temple, he was told to carefully follow the template of all things that exist in heaven. The book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus Christ entered in sprinkling his own blood. Now, great scripture. When the Bible says, Jesus ascended on high, he took captivity captive and gave gifts unto man. And he gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. But there's an amazing portion of scripture there. When he ascended on high, he took captivity captive. Now, what is that? The people who were born on this earth and had come under the faith of Abraham were awaiting the promise did not yet have access to the heavenlies because the blood of Christ had not yet been sprinkled on the heavenly mercy seat. So they went to a holding place. Unfortunately, some of the Catholic teaching, this is where purgatory, that teaching of purgatory came from. It's supported in the book of Maccabees. But Maccabees, those two books of Maccabees were written before Jesus came. So those, those, some of those, what we call peripheral doctrines or problematic doctrines, they are such that uh, they were referring to Abraham's bosom, not to a place where you go to pay off your sin. Jesus Christ pays in full every believer's sin to the uttermost and opens heaven doors for us to be able to come in. So for the modern believer, Jesus stood outside a different Lazarus. That is Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha's tomb. He had been dead four days, the reason for the fourth day is because Jewish people in that day believed that the spirit lingered behind for, for at least three days. So the reason Jesus waited that time is to get over the superstition that people's spirit waited that amount of time and it could be basically risen from the dead. But Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he shall die yet, or though he uh, shall die yet, he'll never die. He shall eternally live. When Jesus said, though he be dead, yet shall he live, we know that Jesus has since ascended to heaven. Now, wonderful scripture. Remember when Jesus was outside the tomb and Mary's outside and he is speaking to her first in Greek. Then he, trans he turns into Ara Aramaic. He says to her, Mary in his native tongue, that's in the scripture. And when she, rec she recognized him, she says, Rabboni. She replies back in, Arab in Aramaic, Rabboni, I recognize you. And he says, don't hold to me. I have not yet ascended to my father. Why? Jesus was functioning then in the role of the high priest. And he was going to offer his own blood 
as the atoning sacrifice for all eternity, yours, mine, Abraham's, Adam's, every single person's sin who died in faith, he was going to atone for. So today, there is no longer a need for that place of Abraham's bosom. Now, I have a theory, please. Theories, doctrine. Chad's theory. So please don't take it and make a homiletical thesis out of this. But what happened, I believe the Bible says that hell hath enlarged herself to contain all that are going therein. I believe that once Jesus when he ascended a high, he took captivity captive. All the people that were held captive to this earth, he took that captivity captive with him to heaven. And now they are in heaven where they are long-term saved, where a Christian today, when they breathe their last here, they breathe their first there with him directly in heaven because the price has been paid. The Bible says once and for all, Christ died for the ungodly. It is instant admission into his presence. Now, all those folks were born on the earth. They had an earthly birth certificate. But when you've been born again, you've been born from above. That word born again is actually better translated born of above. So when you've been born of above, it just makes sense that you go home. That's why you're a stranger and a pilgrim in this world. I'm a stranger in a strange land just passing through. So please make sure that when you're thinking about these things, recognize that your citizenship is no longer of this world. You are in the world, but not of it. Okay, question came through. When you get a chance, I'd like to know if the Lord is... Uh, I'd like to know if the Lord has given me a word. I can't read the rest of it. We talked a little bit about this uh, in last week's episode. Uh, Kathy, I want you to refer you back to that. We went pretty extensively into how to how to get a word um, from the uh, a word word restoration. Okay, I'm sorry. Second part. The Lord gave it to me. The word restoration. He planted it as a seed in my heart, and the Lord has restored. So you can always know. Number one, I'll just touch on this quick. Dan Abagalio, welcome. Thanks for joining tonight. Um, we've been talking about, for those of you that are joining late, we've been talking about, number one, if I harbor forgiveness, unforgiveness in my heart, can I go on to heaven? And the answer is not if you're actually harboring unforgiveness. Uh, no, you cannot. The second thing, but we did talk about that emotions are not the seat that determines truth. Truth is, if you will take it to the Lord in prayer, begin to put it on the blood, by the Holy Spirit, you will forgive by praying blessings on the other person according to what Jesus told us to do. The second thing we've talked about tonight so far is, if a person dies, absent from the body that's present with the Lord, is their soul sleep? There are some interesting scriptures. First Corinthians, I'm sorry, First Thessalonians chapter 4 states and tells us, um, when the dead in Christ shall rise first, we shall be caught up with them. I believe that there's a very, very big difference between a, a, a being risen from the dead and the resurrection. Understand that the resurrection is to take on a glorified body even as Jesus has. In fact, Paul goes into this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says, we don't want to be in a situation where basically we're in a disembodied spirit. We want to be clothed upon. And he draws upon the Old Testament principle of how the tabernacle moved through the wilderness. And that tabernacle was made out of tents. And Law, welcome. Thanks for joining us, Anne. That tabernacle moved throughout uh, that world, but it was a transitional place in the same way that this tabernacle is transitional. I may have to lay aside this body if the Lord tarries and not uh, and, and taste of physical death. But Jesus said that he's the resurrection and the life. Whoever comes to him in faith, they believe in him, yet they die, so shall they live. You will live forever. Listen to me, Christian. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, Death is an impossibility for you in a spiritual sense. You cannot die. And not only that, but it's also going to glorify your physical body. John said when we see him, we're going to be like him. And that is the blessed hope of the church. Pastor Willie McGinnis up in Reno, welcome. God bless you. I'm glad to have you with us tonight. If you have biblical-based questions, if I miss them, I'm going to uh, try to get to them. I believe Kathy White had asked a question. The word restoration. So restoration happens in many ways. One is, I want to go back to the book of Joel, that Joel was promised uh, and promised us that God would restore that which the locust and the canker worm had devoured. So when you're in a situation when uh, you've had a tear down in your life, I believe that there are acceptable years of the Lord. There is time when God begins to restore and do things for individuals, and it can happen in an instant. 
I've lived it. I've walked through it. I've seen the tremendous grace of God. When you receive a prophetic word that talks about restoration, I would say to do what Mary did with the prophetic words she received from Gabriel, even receiving about Christ. You see, the Bible says that she pondered these things in her heart. And I believe that's the first place. The second place is, is to take it to the scriptures. What you received, does it line up with the scriptures? Also, I recommend taking that to a place of biblical authority. If you've got a pastor or an overseer in your church that's a spiritually discerning individual, I would share that, have prayer about it, conversation. Ask the Lord to reveal it to you because we are led by the Spirit. Uh, I believe that's uh, Dana Short. Dana, welcome. God bless you. Welcome to the show. Uh, Janine Evans, God bless you. Welcome to the show. Uh, forgive me for having to lean in. I just have to uh, try to do this mono uh, to a uh, mono tonight or mono a uh, plural uh, this evening. So God bless you. You are tuning in with uh, Truth Alive. I'm one half of the Truth Alive guys. I'm Pastor Chad. Pastor Thad, uh, my colleague, is unfortunately not able to be with us here tonight. He's out sick, but he will be with us again next week. Krista, God bless you. Welcome. It's wonderful to have you tonight. So far in the show, we have discussed uh, unforgiveness. Uh, we've talked about, will unforgiveness keep you out of heaven? And the answer is it can, but don't let emotions dictate your forgiveness level. Let that come from a place of, um, let that come from a place of obedience be forgiving out of obedience and pray. And I believe that the Holy Spirit will empower you. Secondly, we talked about absent from the body, present with the Lord. I got a little theological there, but I wanted to give you some biblical reasons why I do not believe in soul sleep, that I believe that you are instantly awake. Um, the third thing we've been talking about uh, is, is talking about a word. You receive a prophetic word. How do I know it's from the Lord or how can I test it? We talked about that a little bit before, but we've come back and talked about that again. Um, <clears throat> yes, and I just see a great uh, post that came up. Uh, the word of the Lord is for restoration to the original. Remember, God is in the restoration business. In fact, if you will look at the book of Genesis, okay, and how it goes from the, from the perfect state and it moves through a situation where sin comes into the world, where people make a, a decision against God, uh, then the consequences of sin begin to come. So we have a murder and grief, and then we begin to get uh, a person receiving a mark. Cain has a mark set on him. He begins to go forward. If you'll notice in the book of Revelation, you get it going the opposite. People receive a mark of the beast. They begin to move backward. It's a counterfeit, right? God put a mark on Cain that no one would hurt him. It begins to move in backward succession where the mark, people are marked in their forehead who belong to Jesus Christ. The Bible says that then we move to a place where uh, the books are open. There's no sin found for the Christian. So the Christian is no longer held to sin consciousness. The body has been restored. Jesus Christ has given us a resurrected body. We are then in a place Place where we enter back into an eternal perfect state revelations chapter 20 or chapter 21 so if you really look at that incredible uh, uh question uh recognize that god is all about restoration in fact from bookend to bookend what the, the theme of the bible actually is is of course is jesus christ but you'll see this phrase used over and over it says that i will be their god and they will be my people. And that is repeated over and over and over in the books of the Bible. It's one of the, if you will, hidden codes that shows the authenticity of the scriptures and their inner relationship from book to book. You will find that multiple times. If you look up that phrase, I encourage you to go on to uh, your, uh, your you know, Bible gateway or if you want to go down to Esword, uh, that was a good uh, reference we received last week. Uh, take a look at that. Uh, those are places that you can receive some information. So I'm doing my best to try to answer your questions. Unfortunately, it's hard for me to be able to open up some of your questions because I'm online. I have a single phone tonight. Uh, the computer I'm having uh, was not able to load the video, so we're mano a mano. Uh, you're with Truth Alive tonight. I'm Pastor Chad, Pastor Thad, my colleague. Say a prayer for him. He's out sick. You know, Pastor Thad has said some really wonderful things. He's not here tonight, so I'm going to take an advantage of a few minutes just to tell you, Pastor Thad is a truly wonderful man of God. Uh, I really respect his hermeneutics. Uh, his level of, of insight into the study of the scriptures. Also, Pastor Thad's fruit of his life is even witnessed in his kids. Uh, his wife, Colleen, also the, the worship pastor at our church, just a tremendous uh, gift to the body. Uh, pray for him. He's a tremendous brother. I have a great amount of respect for him. He's become a very dear friend and uh, a real insight, a person that I rely on also for biblical support and knowledge. 
Thad, we love you. I know you're watching, so God bless you. Um, do you have uh, another question tonight? If not, I'll jump into the next uh, question that we had from last week. And it's a question that's actually lingered. David, you issued this question, and we only answered part of it. I want to make sure that we uh, we address your question. So I'm going to jump in real fast. If you have a question, I'll try to get back to it. Thank you for bearing with me tonight. Uh, but we will try to get back to your biblical-based questions. Um, that question was not just, is speaking in tongues real and for today? But the question was, how do I speak in tongues? That is a very challenging question. Number one, I'm of, of the belief that you do not train people how to speak in tongues. I believe that when someone receives a gift of the Holy Spirit, the physical evidence, physical evidence of that occurrence is that the person throughout Scripture spoke with other tongues. I believe that it is an event that can come at the time of salvation, or I believe it's an event that can happen after salvation, uh, that that event can happen. Now, please note, at salvation, you have the Holy Spirit. The Bible says no one can come to the Father except the Spirit draw him. So the Holy Spirit is already at work. I, I always, I, I really get frustrated when people try to use the baptism of the Holy Spirit as a spiritual one-upmanship. This is not about one-upmanship or about superior Christians. How do you get more superior than the blood of Jesus himself? That is an impossibility. Jesus Christ has made us every whit whole. But the question is, is how do I speak in tongues? One is, I would say, really immerse yourself in the depths of worship and reverential time with God. I would even say this, don't just seek tongues. I think too often people seek a spiritual gift, and while it is commendable to seek spiritual gifts, seek the gift giver. Now, I know that sounds cliche, seek the gift giver, but please note that you're not just looking for an experience. What you are seeking is, is a one-to-one a -one experience with him and he be in the object. The Bible says, if our eye be single, how great is that light? Don't let your eye become diverted of, oh, well, I'm not speaking in tongues, or I don't think this is real, or I'm having a hard time. I want to encourage you to get lost in God. Listen, if, <laughs> if you're a Christian, and you have never been in a place where you were lost in his presence. My friends, I'm not talking about emotionalism. I'm talking about when you're communing spirit to spirit, where I've been able to temporarily move beyond the corrupt nature of this fallen man. And I'm standing in my, in my spirit close to Jesus and, and close to his presence. And I'm not talking about in a physical, perceptual way. I'm talking about spirit to spirit. Jesus says, the Lord, Father, God is spirit, and those that worship him will worship him in spirit and in truth. It's not in a particular mountain. It's not in a particular temple. This is the temple. So I'm coming to him in a place and I'm laying out, and I'm just in worship, and I'm just in joy. And if you begin to feel that bubble up, my friend, let it out. Let it out. It may feel weird. It may sound odd. But the Bible says that, that out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. I do not like the idea of people coaching people. Say, la, la, ba, ba, sha. I don't like that. I, I think that that is coached. I think that that's a problem. Um, myself, you may have a different interpretation. But I believe in being in a situation where they have really received a gift a gift of a prayer language to the Lord. His presence, the Bible says, is better than life. In his presence is fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. If you get into the presence of Jesus, I would say whether you speak in tongues immediately or not, you just keep on coming back to the well. You just keep coming back to Jesus. Allow yourself to be open. Study the scriptures so that you understand what is biblical. There is no point in the scripture where it demonstrates to us that the gifts ever ceased. Now, I realize, and I have many people that are logging on, and you may disagree. God bless you. Let's not lose fellowship over this fact. Jesus is Jesus. You couldn't come to Jesus without the Holy Ghost. But I would say, if you're in a place, you say, well, I want to know this for today. Come to the Lord with a tender and an open heart and say, God, I don't want anything that's not of you. I do want everything that is of you and receive that your joy may be full. All, the Bible says, Jesus says, whoever asks the Father for the Holy Spirit, he won't withhold him. So ask him for Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will come and abide with you and he will lead you into all truth. The Holy Spirit does not come to give you tongues. 
I know that might be controversial, but the Bible says when he comes, he won't speak of himself. He'll speak of me, Jesus speaking. He will speak of me. He will testify to you things that are, gonna, that are to come, and he will also lead you into all truth. Tongues is an evidence, and it's also a gifted prayer language so that I can pray beyond my understanding. You know, uh, people often at the church say, he's a smart guy. Well, um, I, I, there are people I would say that I would lean on a much greater biblical scholarship than what I possess, much greater knowledge than what I possess, but I want to tell you that tongues are a gift. Pastor Benny Madrid, you're a man of God. Welcome to the show. Uh, welcome to Truth Alive. It's wonderful to have you here, Pastor Benny. Um, Kay, Kay, welcome. God bless you, Kay Kenyon. Welcome to the show. It's wonderful to have you. You're on Truth Alive. Pastor Chad here tonight. My colleague, Pastor Thad, is out. Uh, pray for him. He's going to be raised up very quickly. Uh, we know because we pray in faith, and we know that we receive those things that we ask of him in Jesus' name. So if you're just joining tonight so far in the in the uh, broadcast or the live cast, we have talked about uh, forgiveness and the ability to go to heaven, do I have to forgive? And we've talked about how emotions don't necessarily dictate truth in that, but the actions of active forgiving and taking those things in prayer and praying blessings over those that persecute you and despitefully use you is the key. We've also talked about heaven. How do we get in and are we instantly active with the Lord? And the answer for the Christian today is absolutely no more holding tank for you. The Bible says that the people in the book of Hebrews, they looked on far off and they looked for something that was to come to them. And that's the, by even by their own admission, they said, I'm looking for a city that has foundations, whose maker and builder is God. By such, they stated that they were not of this world, but they were looking for a city that they were moving towards. And they testified by their life that yet a better covenant and a better promise than just this world awaited them. And I want to encourage you to go back if you haven't had the chance Listen to that. I explained Abraham's bosom. That's where some of the doctrine of purgatory comes, why purgatory is not valid because Jesus has paid the ultimate price. Everyone who dies in faith in Jesus Christ in this body huh, never dies. Christian, I hate to break it to you, death is something you will never know. You will have no part in the second or the or the second death. You will have no part in spiritual death ever. Daniel Davis, God bless you. Welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. Um, let me see. I am trying to read on this, um, and I missed a question. I am going to scroll down real fast. Give me a moment. Okay, it's not going to let me. So I missed a question real fast. I'm going to try to come back to it. Forgive me. Um, so I see a question that says hundreds, is not thousands of languages. The Bible is not available in. Uh, there was no a Bible available for the first church, only ancient scrolls available only in the temples. So Christine, I'm going to touch on that real quick. Thank you for that. Uh, there is a great amount of, um, I think, sometimes misunderstanding about some of the biblical texts. So I'm going to give you just a little bit of church history. Take it as valuable to you. But at the time, this is very important because the Septuagint is a translation that took place. There were 70 scholars that worked on the Septuagint. And they went through and they put together a, uh, a rendering of the Hebrew scriptures and translated them into Greek. And that Greek was Koine Greek. It was the common Greek of the day. The New Testament church relied upon these Koine Greek um, uh, uh, letters, but they quoted out of the Septuagint. Well, what happened is, is after the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, Jewish people had a real problem. They had no place left to do their sacrifices, and the Christian church had exploded. We had devout men who were usually Gentiles, but who were coming to the church, um, or that is the synagogue, to receive instruction because they were already finding that their polytheistic ancestor animistic worship was not satisfying anything. So they were coming and they're receiving teaching, but they weren't being circumcised and they weren't being allowed to even join the synagogue in many cases. Paul, when he would go in, he would preach to devout men and often they would hear the word and say, well, I studied this in your scriptures. This makes sense because blindness in part had come upon the Jews, but the open eyes had come to the Gentiles at this point. That really began when Stephen was stoned, I believe, uh, and we could get into that theologically later, but something very amazing happens in the book of Acts where the pivot happens, where God begins to work much more closely. Not that it, people that were Jewish weren't becoming Christians, but a far no more number of, of people become Christians who are now Gentiles, that is non-Jewish 
individuals. Um, and so when they walked through that, I believe that's called goyim, uh, as they were going through that process, they were quoting out of the Septuagint. So the Septuagint was available to the masses. Um, it was available at that time. It was the Greek rendering. Well, the Jews had a problem. What do I do? Gerald, welcome. God bless you. Carolyn, welcome. God bless you. Glad to have you on with us. So what happened is, is that the Jews got together and they created at the Council of Nyamnia that happened in around 90 AD, what was called the Masoretic Text, because they basically had to find a new way when there's no temple left, how do you go through sacrifices? And so that uh, very incredible event of AD 70, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem by Titus Vespasian, who later became Emperor Vespasian, because of that event, uh, the Jews had no place to sacrifice. Uh, the book of Hebrews, in fact, was trying to warn early Jewish Christians not to return back to sacrificial worship in the temple. Well, it became, once it was destroyed, there was no Jewish temple to go back for. There was no trying to get salvation through the shedding of the blood of bulls and goats, oxen and these various things, turtle doves, whatever people would bring to offer. That's why uh, we, we believe that the book of Hebrews was written prior to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD because um, that, that circumstance or that time frame uh, occurred, uh, or the book was written in a context when the temple would have still been there. Jeremiah Frost, welcome. God bless you. Thanks for joining. You're on Truth Alive. I'm Pastor Chad. Pastor Thad, my colleague, is out tonight. Um, I am trying to my best to answer your questions. If I'm missing your questions, please forgive. Um, I want to make sure that I'm answering your questions as best I can. Um, if someone accepts Christ, uh, are they still able to go to heaven? I'm going to scroll down, forgive guys, uh, but not able to read the Bible to know how to live for Jesus because of the location or something else. Are they still able to go to heaven? Great question. Michelle Kincaid, welcome. God bless you. Thank you for logging in tonight. You are on Truth Alive. I'm Pastor Chad. I'm answering uh, your, your questions tonight. One half of the Truth Alive guys. Um, so let me talk about that. The best redemption answer to that, Aaron, is the thief on the cross. The thief on the cross at first, even on the cross, we have it that he was railing against Jesus. But as he's hanging there on the cross, he begins to really, if you take the synoptic gospels, he begins to get a revelation. And he calls out to the other man who's there and says, wait a minute, we're here on this cross. We deserve what we've got. But I ask you, please, master, when you come into your kingdom, will you please remember me? And Jesus says, of assurance, I tell you, this day you'll be with me in paradise. Now, we covered this earlier too. That, I believe, is a place where they went down to Abraham's bosom, a place where they died in faith. And so the thief on the cross had no opportunity to read the scriptures. I don't even know if he could read. He could have been illiterate. At that time, literacy was much further uh, lower on the, on, the, on the totem pole. He's obviously being crucified, and he's admitting that he's guilty for the sin that's brought him there. But what he says is, is, without the ability to do good works, you cannot do any good work to get you into heaven, my friend. The, the master, Jesus, did the good works. He lifted us up. And all you can do is do good works to get inherent rewards. Remember, two judgments for the world. One, the Bema Seed of Christ judgment. That Bema Seed of Christ is a place where our works will be taken into play. Chris Romero, welcome. God bless you, brother where our works will be brought into play and we will receive rewards, each man according to his works, either hay, wood, and stubble, or gold, uh, precious stones, uh, and precious gems, and silver, the things that go into the fire. Everything will be tried by fire. And there will be some people, the Bible says, that will only be saved, really, if you will, the old proverbial thing by the skin of their teeth. But the reality is, is that they will be saved. If you look to Jesus Christ, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. If you receive Christ, you can begin to believe God because in the book of Acts, he even says, you and your household. Why? Because confession is made unto salvation. So if you're in a situation where you have believed in your heart in Jesus, it is not just a cognitive thing. It is one thing to say of faith. I've got a table here in front of me. I can set my Bible down on this table. And by doing so, I recognize that this table will hold that Bible. I had no question. I have actually put faith that this table can hold up this Bible. Now, I wouldn't stand on it. I don't have faith it could hold me up. But I have faith it will hold this Bible, right? 
my life will begin to exhibit a faith in Jesus by seeking out what he says and by walking out what he told me to do. Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I say? I believe it is a natural condition of a Christian to jump out and to begin to follow and obey Christ. But that place, what we call lordship theology, you may not have time to become, let Jesus become your Lord. You may be the thief on the cross. You may be in a hospital room. It's never too late. Make sure you get out to the highways and the hedges. My brother David is in a, a, a hospital right now, and he is sharing the gospel with people inside of that hospital because many people are right at the edge. Listen, do deathbed repentances work? Absolutely. But a, a, an old brother, I believe his name was Pastor Gowan, my mother would tell you the story, that he preached a sermon. It's the one she got saved on. And, and she was a young 12-year-old, 13-year-old girl, and he held up two roses. And he said, you can give God this beautiful rose, which is the rest of your life in youth. And it can be used for godly purposes, crushed into perfume. Uh, it can be given as a gift. It can be uh, given to someone to, for joy. It can be made to make places beautiful. And then he held up this old crinkled, des destroyed rose. And he said, or you can give him this one. Now, God will take both. Um, but the idea is, is what was the intent of your heart? And someone posted that up earlier. God doesn't look just on the acts of men, but he looks upon the heart. That's why David was a man after God's own heart, despite his many sins. But he would always say, but thou, O oh God, you're a shield for me. You're my king. And I want to make sure that you give him the good rose. Give him your life so that your reward's in heaven. Now think about this. People here, I would encourage you, if you don't invest, you, I believe it's good to invest. But here's the issue. Why would you invest your life into this world that's passing away and fail to make an investment where you are going to live a billion years from now? Jesus says, I give them eternal life. They'll go in and out and I give them life. I give them pasture. Why would you live your life for this place that's passing away? Live your life for the blessings of eternity that are going to come. Here's a question. This might be a silly question, but why is it that... It, at one church, you might have the Holy Spirit come on you and get totally touched and feel it, but not in another church. Okay, so I actually think it's a good question, Michelle. I'd like to tackle that. So I believe that one of the things that transpires, sorry, I'm looking at the clock, um, is that we get into atmospheres, I believe, where the Holy Spirit is really welcome to move. Gina Burroughs, welcome. God bless you. Thank you for joining Truth Alive. I believe we get into atmospheres where there's faith and sincere worship, and a freedom for people to worship in spirit and in truth. And I want to make sure that people um, are in a place where they uh, have access to the Lord. Think about this. Uh, coming in, and I see another question come through. Tasha, I'll get to your question in a moment. Um, so what happens is, I believe people come into particular environments, and they're unable to go through and fully uh, have time with God. They're so on a schedule, so on a regiment that time in corporate worship sometimes is is uh, cut short. It is uh, too scheduled. Uh, we do we do two hymns and then announcements and then the offering, then two more slow songs and then the message. Now I understand I'm not against people doing that. I believe in decency and order according to biblical principles. But if we're in a situation where the Holy Spirit does not have the room to move, where he's on such a timetable, and we're saying this, Lord, my way be done, not thine, right? Um, I think we have to be careful of that. At the same time, I, we don't want to lose decency and order in church either. Uh, that is a biblical principle uh, supported in the book of 1 Corinthians where he talks about the use of gifts. And I encourage you all, read 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14. In fact, you might even find in there that there's some things you didn't even know were gifts. Were gifts. Uh, speaking of gifts of help and gifts of administrations. So be aware of those things. Study them. The Bible says to earnestly covet the gifts. But we're not just talking about that. We're talking about what, how do I feel? Remember this, though, and I do want to caution and encourage Pentecostals that are out there or charismatics. Just because you received goosebumps or didn't receive goosebumps does not mean that God was any more there or not there. Okay? Uh, number one, his spirit fills the earth. He's everywhere. What you're talking about is your ability to perceive what happened uh, what is going on in the supernatural. That doesn't mean the supernatural is not going on all around you. The Bible says that whenever two or three gather together in my midst, I'm in the midst of them. Um, when that happens, two or three coming together, he's there. 
says Jesus. So please don't think, well, the Lord wasn't there. And I hear this kind of conversation sometimes, and I think it's problematic. Oh, the Lord was really there today. No, the Lord is there every time. The question is, were we able to move into a place where we were able to perceive his presence and respond to him? And that's really the difference. So I hope that's helpful. Anytime two or three gather together in his name, if we can get into a place, us, where we get our minds off this world, that's one of the most important things about our own, um, our own communion with him corporately is that I believe we begin to corporately experience, if you will, or become perceptually aware of what is true, that he is there in the midst of us. Okay, I got scolded not to look at a clock. Sorry, I, I, I will try not to do it too much, but I know our time's starting to get tight. Uh, a question came up. I know people who have prayed several times to receive the Holy Ghost and get discouraged when they don't receive. Advise. Okay, number one, again, Every Christian who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and confesses him has the Holy Spirit. The difference is, is are you in a place where you have been, has the Holy Spirit within you, I'm going to use a term, but has he splashed out onto the outside of you? The baptism of the Holy Spirit, when with the physical evidence of speaking in tongues, happens multiple times in the book of Acts. What that really is, is, is the manifestation, the physical manifestation and the prayer language that begins to happen. Sister Tasha, what I would recommend that a person do, number one, is to go back to the scriptures. Faith, I believe you receive the Holy Spirit by faith. I believe we receive salvation by faith. I don't wake up the next morning and I'm six inches taller when I prayed to Jesus and suddenly a physical change happened. I receive salvation by faith. My relationship with God is predicated upon faith. It is, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So when you are going through to receive the power of the Holy Spirit and receive the gift of tongues, if you will, uh, that is not the only gift that you can receive, but that is an evidence shown up in scripture Please recognize that receiving that gift and beginning to speak in tongues, I encourage people to go back, read the scriptures to build their faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So first, build your faith. Secondly, I encourage you to be around and, and to be prayed with and for. I do believe that it happens with the laying on of hands. It can also happen in your shower. Uh, Cornelius in his house, uh, we have no evidence that, that Peter ever laid hands on Cornelius to the, receive the Holy Spirit. He was there. He's talking while he was talking. It doesn't say he was walking around placing his head, hand on people's heads. They began to have a spiritual experience with Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. Peter is beyond blown away. He's like, I shouldn't even be here. In fact, one of the best sermons I ever heard was somebody saying, I shouldn't be here. And it was about Peter going to these Gentiles, this Italian man uh, from Rome, right? Italy. Uh, shout out to Pastor Vinny. Uh, he was out there uh, and he's not even thinks he's supposed to be there, but he got a revelation earlier. The sheet taken up three times, then three men come, right? The whole correlation. Don't call unclean what I've called clean. What that means is when Jesus laid his, his self on the cross, he paid for the sins of the world. John didn't say, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the Jews. He says, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Were you born on earth? You qualify. You can be forgiven, and the Bible says that you can uh, receive the Holy Spirit because Jesus said, anyone who asks the Father for the Holy Spirit, he will not hold him back. He will give him to him. I hope that helps answer the question. I encourage you to be around people of like faith. Be prayed for. I do think that there are some people that really do just have seem to have this knack, if you will, or spiritual gift of the laying on of hands for people to receive the Holy Spirit. So I do want to encourage people to do that as well. I hope that answers the question. Um, let's see. I'm sorry. I'm going back here. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. What's the difference between the two? I don't think that there is a difference myself. Now, I will draw out from that place where he says, he's speaking of uh, that question that just came through, says, well, he's, he's talking at a time when John the Baptist was going through and he was saying, um, one is coming after me who is mightier than me, this is John the Baptist speaking, whose sandal I'm not worthy to unlatch, okay? I'm talking about the creator, the one that made me, is what John's saying. But when he comes, he says, I baptize you with water. But when he comes, he will baptize you in the Holy Ghost and with fire. I don't necessarily believe that there is a difference between those two. 
Jeremiah wrote, it is like fire shut up in my bones. When I said to God, I'm not prophesying on your behalf anymore. It's too painful. It's too costly. They don't want to listen. He says, I could not keep quiet. It was like a fire shut up in my bones. I believe that the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, because cloven tongues of fire appeared above their heads. That there was a physical manifestation of what was happening internally. So I believe the actual, the two are synonymous. Now, fire throughout scripture is always representing of a purifying agent. I believe that when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, some people say, I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit. They'll talk in tongues all day long, but they live in, in abject sin and consistent basis. John tells us, 1 John, anyone who has been born of God does not persist in sin. Now, I believe the power of the Holy Spirit can abide in you. And when you get to those close places with God, the fire of God begins to work in you and begins to burn out the impurities in your life. So the Holy Spirit, uh, the fire, I believe, accompanies him. And that fire, I believe, these are together, not separate. And I believe that that fire is to purify you and also to give you an unction to share the gospel and to share truth. I come on here, uh, Pastor Thad, with me to share the truth because we love you. We want you to be built up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Now, uh, again, if you're a person who says, well, I don't believe that. I, I don't think that's for me or I don't think it's for today. Listen, we will not break fellowship. We do not want that to be a point of contention. Is Christ divided? Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God, the sole sacrifice, the one who had the ability to pay it all. Think about this. Mm, this is good. Think about this. Everyone that was born on the earth was born from Adam. Adam was a sinner. We were sold as a family. If you've ever studied brick kiln slavery, that happens in Pakistan and places of India, some places even up into Afghanistan, some of these regions. It's a place where a person and a family will make a bargain and they are put in a place where they have to work off their debt. But when they're put to that place, making bricks in a kiln area, when they do that, my brother Amir Afiq, he, he helps rescue people out of brick kiln slavery. But what happened is, as we were born on this earth, we weren't able to get away from what our great, great, name the number of generations, grandfather sold the family into. The pitiful thing about brick kiln slavery is that while they're in that slavery, debt continues to accrue just from them living and working there. They charge them for materials. They charge them uh, for, for to live on premise. They charge on the premises. They charge them for clothing. They charge them for tools. They charge them for the actual materials and they can never get out. Every single one of us in that family, or every single one of them in that family is stuck under brick kiln slavery because they inherit their father's debt in that culture. That's the culture we were born under. We were born under sin, and sin is pervasive. Sin is passed from generation to generation. However, when Jesus came, the second Adam, and I saw someone post that up a moment ago. Glory to God, you're awesome, whoever posted that up. When that happened, what ended up occurring is, is you became born of above. When you were born of the second Adam, Jesus Christ, you no longer had a sin debt. Jesus paid it all. The Bible says Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. What does that word propitiation mean? The best translation we could use in English is the satisfaction. That which satisfies the requirement to restore relationship with God. Jesus Christ satisfied that particular uh, that particular debt and set you free. All you have to do is receive it. Jesus did the heavy lift. You just have to receive it. You receive by faith and you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. I, if you ever gone back, if you want to study or read my sermon on homologous, that is to say the same thing as God concerning his son Jesus, to say the same thing as God, homo, same, lologous language, to say the same thing as God, I resonate with God into the eternal, and I am saying Jesus Christ is the one way, I commit my life to him, I believe, Father, you've raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Here comes another uh, question that came through real fast. And we are beyond time, so I'm going to take this last one. Can you explain biblically about the different crowns and jewels that we get when we get into heaven? Okay, 
Uh, Aaron, what I would want to do before I answer that, I'd like to table that one. I want to do a little bit of pulling because I know there's multiple crowns. There's, you know, the victor's crown. There is the soul winner's crown. There is the uh, martyr's crown. Uh, there's the crown of life. There's the crown for those that just simply love um, his appearing. So um, I, I would like to dig in a little bit on that. I, I'll bring up the scriptures next time. We'll talk about eternal rewards. You know, one thing I want to leave you with, or two things actually I want to leave you with, because one is always, or two is always better than one when you uh, love to teach, um, is number one, if your vision of heaven, in, in your mind, if you see like these gates and this stuff, this, this city, uh, and you go, oh, okay, and you see clouds, please understand that that is not um, a, a circumstance where you are um, in a place where, where you're in some dream ethereal location. Uh, John Lamson, God bless you. Welcome for joining uh, on Truth Alive. Um, it's not a place of cloud. Heaven is a country proven in the book of Hebrews. It says that they testified by their life that they were seeking another country, one that is made by God's hands. And they're going out to go to a city. A city is in a country to a place to be with God who, because he is the maker and the builder of Heaven. So I want to ensure that you understand that heaven is not like um, some ethereal uh, cloud place. Uh, it would be the same right now as if you were logging in from Hawaii, you would be in a different time zone. As I'm speaking here right now in Hawaii, it is closer, I believe, I think they're five hours behind us, Pacific time. So they would be like a little after three o'clock in the afternoon there. They're in a different time zone, but we could still communicate. They're just in a, heaven is just a new location to which we move into. I believe myself, theory, not doctrine, Chad's theory, I believe it's a different place where we are uh, really moving into a new dimension, God's original dimension, this one inferior to the first, because the first created this one, and God rules over them all, and that's happening. So, uh, Aaron, I'm going to come back and answer that next week. Before I go, I always want to give everyone the opportunity to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and to receive Jesus as Savior. Listen to me, friend. I understand that you may have a cognitive thing. Okay, Jesus died on the cross, the whole Easter and Christmas thing. Sounds awesome. Great. And you go on living your life. What is with those Christians? They're overly radical. There's too much going on. Please note, that it, faith is active. Faith without works is dead. Now, that does not mean you work your way into heaven. But it, what it means is, is when you actually have faith, works are going to naturally follow. I want to encourage you. You're not saved by works. You're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ and that alone. But the idea is, is if your life, if you're not communing with God, if you're not opening up your spirit and having a relationship with him, I don't want it to be a cerebral exercise only. Salvation is entire. My mind, my body, how I live my life, my thoughts even brought into captivity to Christ. My speech is going to change. Out of the abundance of my heart, my mouth will speak. Jesus becomes, he comes to me. I've literally inhabited and deal with the creator of all heaven and earth. And when that happens, suddenly his spirit comes. And if anyone be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. All things have become new. Friend, if all things haven't become new for you, I want to encourage you to really receive Jesus. Listen, he is the one that came again from heaven to give you citizenship in a new country. Jesus is your agent. Jesus is your only way, only truth, and only life. He is there to make sure, not just to help you in this life, but he is working to ensure that you have eternal life with him. The scripture says in the book of Revelation that wherever he goes, his bride goes with him. They love him and they go in and out with him. If you are connected to Jesus, you will live forever. Listen to me. It's impossible to die spiritually. You will live forever. And if you're on the earth when he returns, you go instantly and never taste death. So Jesus's deal for you is this. I did all the heavy lifting for you. I took your sin upon myself. I carried the cross. I endured the shame. Now I've sat down at the right hand of the Father. Come be seated with me in heavenly places with the Father and be one with me as he and the Father are one. Jesus is the mediator between God and man. There's the ABCs of salvation. I want to give them to you and it's a powerful thing you can use even with those you're witnessing to. Number one, A, acknowledge that you're a sinner. And I give credit to Pastor J.D. Farag for this. I say, A, acknowledge you're a sinner. B, believe in your heart 
that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God has raised him from the dead for your salvation, overcoming death, hell, and the grave. And see, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. You can simply say, Father, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I believe in my heart that you sent Jesus to pay for my sins on the cross, that his sinless life took away my sins, and I confess him to before others. Get in a good Bible-believing church. Church Alive is welcoming you, but if you uh, are a member of another church, you live in a different area, get in a good Bible-believing church that teaches the unbridled Word of God, cover to cover, and grow in the knowledge of Him, get into fellowship with the saints. God bless you. We love you. Thank you for joining tonight on Truth Alive. Pastor Thad will be back with me next week. We love you. You can repost this message out. I'm so uh, grateful for those of you that do. Uh, hopefully tonight has helped to learn a little bit about life after death, uh, talking about forgiveness, uh, talking about gifts of the Spirit, talking about tongues, uh, and really going into areas uh, about what it means to be able to be one with God and re receiving Holy Spirit. I want to encourage you, if you're a person who's discouraged tonight, God loves you. We love you too. And uh, we're so thankful to be in fellowship with you. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening. The Lord bless you. Lord, Lord, keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord Jesus Christ himself lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. God bless you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ.